power record. Thank you. Um, we, we had to change the thought process. And then as time evolved, what happens after the shooter's down? Then we had to evolve into that, getting EMS in there and getting into the patients. So my name is Josh Rini, as you saw in that intro there. I ended up, my background in history comes from the war on terror. I was a Marine Corps in there, a Fleet Marine Force. I was part of the Navy, but attached to Marine Corps as a medic. And I uh, did three tours in Iraq. Between those three tours, I've had about 100 casualties and everything from blast injuries, gunshot wounds to um, not really many stabbing victims because it wasn't, we never got close enough to any of these guys for that. But um, during that time, this picture here is after a firefight there. And those casualties were a mix of civilian and military. And during that time, we used tourniquets, hemostatic agents, and we saved a lot of lives on the battlefield because I was able to give quick and, uh, care to those victims. Right here is my other partner that I teach with, uh, Alan Garcia. He's kind of the one that started up this program. And we have been teaching this across the country, like I was saying. And um, the majority of students have been police officers in that response. And we taught the first sole officer response and the second officer response, tourniquet use and hemostatic agent. It wasn't really even allowed in EMS world back then, 10 years ago, tourniquets and and uh, quick clot was, wasn't even a thought at the time. And that goes to show how things have developed and the thought process has changed because now we're seeing that in protocols across the country, which is awesome. Uh, I got on North Providence fire, probably, I, yeah, I've been on the job for 10 years now, just after I got out of the military, spent a few years recovering. Um, I'd been wounded in 04 from a car bomb and you know PTSD and stuff developed over time and, and dealt through that and worked through it. And this has become therapy for me is teaching programs like this. So it's a different world now. You know, we've had to evolve from the days of just picking up people out of homes for the, you know, the doing the low blood sugars and those common falls. We've developed into this world of active shooters and it requires a different response. Up here in the top left is the Columbine incident. We have Harold and Klebold here in the cafeteria. Um, and then over here is the library at Columbine. Down here on the left is Virginia Tech. They're taking some victims out. And right here, one of the eye openers is this Forza coffee shop. In this incident, the sole intended victims were first responders. The shooter walked in there, executed four police officers where they sat, left the other customers and the barista alone walked back out. And another speaking to that, you talk about first responders, is just recently, a couple of days ago, those officers were ambushed in Connecticut. It came in as a domestic. We're seeing that more and more. There's an old saying in combat. Professionals are predictable. Good thing the world is full of amateurs. And in this situation and in the world that we work in, we're all working professionals. We all have a job that we do. We have a protocol that we follow. The problem is the bad guys know that too. So they know that when you call 911, the professionals are coming, the police are coming. So there's an ambush set up. The officers arrived on the scene, made contact at the door, immediately engaged by a suspect with a AR-15. Uh, long rifle and uh, killed two officers instantly, one's in critical, and a fourth was wounded. This one right here, the picture of the, the bank robber there, that's a North Hollywood bank robbery. This was the first time in history that the bad guys outgunned the cops. The cops back then were just armed with small pistols, just your, your standard revolvers. And what they actually had to do was break into a, a gun store to get long rifles to fight these guys. And you go to thinking outside the box, the way they took these guys down because they had full body armor on was shot them in the feet. They skipped rounds underneath the vehicle. And uh, that's a vain, very painful injury to get shot in the feet like that. They were able to, to finish the job once they were knocked down. And over here is just us training in the school. But this is the world we live in. And this requires a different response than our everyday, you know, we, we go to the call for, you know, grandma fell down the stairs when the when gravity's off its axis and everybody in town's falling down. You know, this is a completely different type of response. So here's some eye-opening statistics too. 61 of these active shooter incidents that led to over 100 deaths in 2021, a 52% increase from 2020. That's from some of the FBI data that I was looking at. You know, last year's attacks were spread across 30, years, uh, 30 states, 103 people dead and 140 wounded. In 2021, they noticed a growing trend too because professionals are predictable and good thing world is full of amateurs. And these guys learn from the prior shooters and try to increase the body count. What we're also finding is, is these potential shooters and active shooters are going on sites like Reddit, 
4chan, these back channel websites that are hosted in countries like Russia and talking about the active shooters that have happened already and trying to figure out how to increase the body count. They're looking for bigger targets. Um, they know that once a active shooter happens, that there's going to be a full EMS police fire response to that scene. So they leave that scene and go to another scene and start creating another active shooter at that location. And sometimes I play a video in here around this time of there's a guy uh, live stream a shooting in a mosque in New Zealand before they had the giant gun ban over there. And that's what actually led up to it. But he was an extremist. He was video. He had the whole active shooter on a web on a um, phone and he was live streaming it to Facebook. And you see him walking through executing people inside that building with no resistance. There was one guy in that whole shooting that tried to come after the shooter, but the shooter got in before he was able to, to affect an attack. The takeaway from that, though, is you figure one second is one trigger pull. And how much time does it take us to get dispatched to that scene as a police officer or first responder? Those bodies are beginning to pile up. And that's what you got to be walking into is stacks of bodies in these, in these rooms. You know, we're a movie-driven society, so that's pretty much all we have to compare to in a gunfight, you know. When first time I got shot at in Iraq, I couldn't even believe I was getting shot at. You know, bullets are loud when they go by your head. Like it's just that shock and awe factor. Like, is this really happening right now? There was no like exciting music. It wasn't dark and rainy. It was just a normal day. And we walked into an ambush and all of a sudden we started taking fire. And one thing I can tell you about getting shot at is bullets are move faster than sound. So if you hear that snap noise going by your head, the bullets are already long gone. It's you'll never hear the one that gets you. That's the only good thing about it. I can say about getting shot at, I guess. But um, looking at these statistics here, 10 of the most deadly shootings occurred in the last 10 years alone. That's a sobering fact. You guys remember the Vegas concert when he was in an elevated position and he had an effective field of fire at a high angle, you know, you know affecting casualties across a large area. The Orlando nightclub, 49 dead, Virginia Tech, the Sandy Hook Elementary. It's just endless amount of different locations that these shooters are, are uh, taking advantage of. Here's some more statistics. Some of these are um, workplace violence. You know, there's, it can, it can be anywhere, any location that there's a large amount of gathering. Um, there's some kind of background on these active shooters. Uh, we're more focused on treating the actual victims that these guys create. That's our primary focus. You know, they may have detailed plans for the attack. When you looked at, we looked at uh, the New Zealand one, he actually got plans for the mosque. He checked out prayer times. And he was looking at other details, trying to figure out when the most amount of people were going to be there at that location. You know, a lot of times we found throughout our history as well, this is what changed our response was these active shooters, a lot of times were suicidal. So when they were engaged by somebody with a uniform, they immediately committed suicide because they want to keep control of the situation, their destiny. Uh, it's been happening more now where they're fighting back. But a lot of times they try to commit suicide. So that really pushes the response of the sole officer and the two officer response. When you arrive on the police officer arrives on scene, he immediately is going to the sound of the guns. So some of the objectives today. We're going to look at some of the injuries that are preventable that you could fix at your level as an EMS provider, as a as a um, first responder, some of these injuries that have caused uh, people to die, but that were very treatable at your level. Um, identify, identify some wounds and injuries that require use of a tourniquet and proper application and use of tourniquets. Rescue task force, which is a very new concept for us, especially in the EMS world, and use of hemostatic agents. And I'm going to talk about some rescue drags and carries that are very simple because, as you know, an unconscious person has no angles. So how does stuff all come about? So during the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan, the survival rates were unbelievable. If you look at this picture up here in Vietnam, these guys aren't wearing body armor. Their helmets are basically just a, a shin, a thin piece of metal. It didn't really stop bullets. It was designed to stop shrapnel. And so when they were, these guys are shot or hit by shrapnel, they had a very uh, low survival rate when, when uh, struck by that type of uh, weaponry. But in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had level four threat plates with, uh, with, that was made out of ceramic that stopped a lot of these rounds. In 2001, we had TCCC was formed. I talked that for many years. It was a great program that was directed more towards the military. What they found throughout that TCCC was that 60% of these deaths resulted from bleed outs. 
The big takeaway from that is a bullet in the mountains of Afghanistan or Iraq is going to do the same exact thing to you and the human body as it will here in America. So the gunshot wound should be treated the same. That was the big point that I was trying to make originally when we started this was why can't we treat injuries on the battlefield here the same way in America? Like why, why is there a, a disconnect there? The second one was 33% of these battlefield deaths were attributed to a ten, thing called tension pneumothorax. Um, I mean, tension pneumo. So you probably remember that from EMT class. It's a medic level skill, skill and it develops from blunt trauma. It can also happen from open chest wall. That's what you're more worried about, these gunshot wounds. It takes a little while to develop. It's not instantaneous. But this was the second leading cause of death and then airway injuries. I'll talk about some easy ways to treat this stuff. So what's your role in all this? Here's a sobering fact. 90% of all these trauma-related deaths occur before the patient ever re reaches the hospital. You know, proper care was not rendered, nothing done at all for the patient. We find that a lot throughout doing these case studies and history. It's not like you have a combat medic or a corpsman or something standing beside you or in the fight with you when you become a victim, a gunshot, uh, or a blast injury, whatever it might be here in America. Uh, that's just the way, just the way it is. You know, you're not in an active combat role, so you're not going to have those type of, of medical personnel around you. And the first person providing care could be self-aid, whether it's you or your partner, you know, as a police officer or whatever type of first responder, or a medic or EMT that might be responding to the scene. So what are we doing with better survival? Faster evac times, right? That's been big with TAC teams and medics and things. But here's the difference, especially with tactical teams, because we I hear this a lot, you know, doing this training, like, oh, you know, we got these TAC teams assembled and things. 98% of these active shooters are over within the first 15 minutes. The active shooting part is done. The shooter has been either dead or he's barricaded somewhere. Doesn't mean the incident's completely over, but the active victim killing and shooting is over within the first 10 to 15 minutes. You know, an officer has responded, engaged with the shooter, and they've either barricaded or committed suicide. So the other problem with, we talk about faster evac times. Town of North Province, where I work, we have a very short transport time to Fatima Hospital. It's right around the corner. But like I was just talking to Doc about just before this class started, a couple of victims could overwhelm their staff, and now they're shut down as a hospital. The other major thing that we found was with, uh, which one was it? It was Newtown. So Newtown, the hospital, I mean, not the hospital, the school was on a hill. And when the active shooter began, everyone gets notified. The kids are going to know. I mean, the parents are going to know long before we even get notified as the police and fire and the first responders because of social media. You know, kids are going to be calling their parents saying help. And, you know, that's what they're trained to do. So it's going to go out everywhere. And all the parents responded to the school to go help their kids like any concerned parent would. The problem was, is when they drove up that single entrance to get to the school, they just left their vehicles. They got out of their vehicles and ran to the school. Again, just like any concerned parent would. This made a huge problem for the rescues. Now the rescues, number one, couldn't get up there to them and they couldn't get out. They actually had to bring in tow trucks to tow the vehicles out of the way to take people to the hospital. So when you're at the command level and you're dealing with these types of incidents, it's just something to think about in the back of your mind of what you might be faced with in these types of incidents, what has happened historically. We also have better trained personnel with the self-aid stuff, with the buddy aid skills, and better personal equipment, body armor, training that develops the hemorrhage controls. And the last one, they learned from our mistakes. I'll tell you a couple of stories today of mistakes that I made on the battlefield that um, people, unfortunately people lost their lives because of it. But the big one here is body armor. You know, we're starting to see the fire department more so police officers have their some sort of armor most of the time when they respond to their calls but we're starting to see first responders take the initiative and get body armor if they can afford it so this video here is the uvalde school shooting this is from the security camera in the hallway and it's i started the video from where the shooter walks into the school here just be aware of your audience because this gets um get a little crazy are you guys hearing sound on your end Yes. Good to go. Shooters now walked into the first classroom. There's two classrooms side by side here.
one major takeaway from this, no accident happens because of one failure point. There was multiple failure points in this shooting. So number one, the door was blocked open. Guy walked right inside the school here. As he made entry to those classrooms, you saw how he just walked in. The locks actually failed months ago on those two doors in the classroom. They were putting multiple requests to have the doors locks fixed. So if this ever happened and not the shooter, he wouldn't be able to walk into a classroom. And as you see, he just walked directly in there and started engaging victims. Shortly, you're gonna see the police response. In the parking lot, just before he walked in, an officer drove directly by the shooter. He was, we say smooth as fast, fast as smooth. He was driving by so fast, he didn't even see him. A second officer actually asked permission to engage the shooter from dispatch. What his thought process was, to go back to be trained how you fight, is officers are taught, you always need to know what your backstop is when you discharge your weapon. What's behind what you're shooting at? And the school obviously was behind him. So his thought process was, am I gonna hit kids inside that school? You can see rounds coming through the wall here. And that's another thing. It's not like the movies where, you know, if you shoot a thousand rounds at a house and nobody gets hit. These walls are very thin and rounds will go right through them in the real world. The initial response to this active shooter is correct. You'll see the officers come down. They're going right to the sound of the guns. And then you'll see where things start to go. Over. Moving to the shooter. Stacked on the door, they're peeking in. They should have made entry as soon as they got to that door. Get money, 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 money. It's not gonna change anything. So what happened there was is the shooter saw them stacking on the door and peeking in. And he began to engage the officer. One of them took a little bit of shrapnel from the rounds hitting the door and they backed out. This is where things started to go wrong and fall apart. Now they're stacking on the door and they think they've got a barricaded suspect. You hear shots still actively being fired. And you have down kids inside that room. The other thing is, is you've got officers down on this end, also officers on that end of the hallway. So if the shooter comes out, now you're going to have blue on blue because you're shooting, uh, you're crossfiring down the hallway here. You know, but this is part of what happens in these stressful incidents. You know, these guys have never experienced like this. It might happen once in your career, or once in your lifetime, or hopefully never. But it goes to show how long these guys have been trained and, you know, practice and all that stuff. And it's still, there was a failure in response. What we'd like to teach is as a first responder, you are better trained, better equipped and have better experience than these active shooters. Some of these kids that are the active shooters, you have more time on the job. Some of these officers have been on the job for 30 years. You know, this kid was 20 something years old that was affecting this, the shooting inside here. So um, that just goes to kind of the response to it. So learning from our mistakes, this is a big one to the, speaks to the command side of things. It really starts at the top. You know, Pulse nightclub, 49 killed, 58 wounded. The shooter was pinned down in the back of the club during this active shooter incident. He initially went in there, started engaging targets. He had, it was, uh, you know, a large dance floor. He was, he was shooting victims all over the place. When the police made their response in, the shooter barricaded himself in the back of the nightclub. There was a rescue task force established outside, but the fire department leadership was, refused the response. The shooter was killed three hours into the incident. What the major takeaway from this is, 
we talk about bleed outs, right? It takes from a complete artery dissection. It only takes three minutes. You know, if no effect, no tourniquet or a hemostatic agent is used, you can bleed out very quickly. So how many people died during those three hours while they were laying on the floor waiting for someone to come help them? Also, tension pneumos. We say it takes a while to develop. That was three hours. That's more than enough time for a tension pneumo to kill someone. Very simple, fixable injuries at our level were let go and people died because of it. Uh, Parkland High School, another example, 17 killed, 17 wounded. The Sheriff's Department, he was acting as the incident commander and denied multiple requests from a fire chief to allow his RTF in there in the classrooms that had already been cleared and secured by police. You know, you had, once again, the shooter was down or barricaded and the rescue task force, which is wearing a helmet and a flak and a, a, a bulletproof vest, were not allowed in there to start treating victims. You know, that was a failure from the command level. And when we talk about this stuff, it's the Marine Corps predicated itself on small unit leadership. The decisions were made all the way down to the most junior guy in the platoon. In the, we operated usually in 10 to 14 man squads, but inside that, everybody could make decisions. Everybody makes decisions as a team. So when you respond to these incidents, the ones that are in the front and the ones that are in the middle that are the ones going to be making the decisions. Because when the, when the gunfire starts, the only thing that matters is the guy to your left and your right. Everything else goes out the window. Politics, command, radio communication, all goes out the window. And just now, we saw that video of the Uvalde Elementary, where there was 21 killed and 17 wounded. So if you look at the response, 376 law enforcement officers respond to this. That's a force larger than the garrison that defended the Alamo. You know, for one kid that had no training, was just in there, you know, shooting the place up. It just happened. It was a target opportunity for him, you know, and that goes back to the command part of it. And the investigators looked at this. In the absence of that strong incident commander, another officer should have stepped up. It goes back to that small unit leadership, you know, where I hear it many times in my classes on both sides of the fence, you know, the fire department and the, and the police side. When you're tasked with making a decision, it comes down to, am I going to get in trouble for this? You know, and what that goes back to when I try to teach is carried by six or tried by 12. You know, the decision that you make in that moment is either going to decide whether that person lives or that person dies. And if you get tried by 12, you know, that's basically saying a jury or you're up in front of your chief and he's kind of busting your chops about why didn't you listen to us? And you went in there and we're pulling people out. Well, I went in there to pull people out to save lives. You know, I had the helmet and, a, 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 you know, body armor. We were trying to effectively save lives. Do something, don't do any, just don't do nothing. So a lot of these mistakes came from a lack of manpower, but an absence of leadership and effective communications. I usually saw the different agencies that responded in there. Uh, you had not very effective communication because there were so many different agencies. I even saw a game warden as that video plays on that was responding in that incident. The big takeaway from that as well is there was RTF training throughout all these organizations prior to the incident happening and still everything fell apart. Especially with, you look at Orlando, massive organization, tons of money, tons of training and a big budget for, for all these types of stuff and for equipment. And it was still a, a big failure. You know, and we say too, what stops armed bad guys is armed good guys, you know, the cops with guns. There's also been a number of incidents where the shooter was stopped by somebody that was unarmed. We talk about that run, hide, fight, when they were back into a corner, they jumped on top of the shooter and were able to, to disarm him that way. So what's the take home from all this? You know, we've been talking about this in the beginning here. You know, the guidelines that I'm presenting today is more of an advisory. You gotta develop your own plans. You know, everybody in this class works with different agencies. You follow different role. You have different roles in your agencies. Um, you're working at command level, you know, firefighter level, police level, whatever it might be. So take away the stuff that I'm gonna talk about tonight and develop your own plans from it. Um, again, that's just back to our training here we did with the fire side. You kind of see these guys moving in as an RTF here. And number one thing on this slide is train how you fight. I always have my guys wear the equipment that you're going to use in when you respond to these incidents. Because when you're under stress, and especially when you're in a, uh, under fire like this, simple things become difficult. And just something as simple as putting on your gear becomes a difficult, can become a challenge. 
So I moved this around a little bit. I put the rescue task force in the beginning because I want to give you the structure of what a rescue task force is, what its role is, and then we're going to talk about what you're going to do inside that rescue task force as you come upon these victims. Why is it important? Like we were saying in the beginning there, pre-hospital care is the mo most important aspect if uh, this person is going to live or die. You know, if you don't arrive alive at the hospital, there's nothing we can do for you. The problem is we can't bring back the dead yet, unfortunately. The simple way to think about this whole process is your body's a container. You got five liters of fluid in it. Once you start punching holes in it, you got to plug those holes because that fluid that's coming out of your body can only be replaced at the hospital. The other thing, too, is you're trying to do the most amount of good for the most amount of victims. You know, as a first responder, especially, there's going to be a massive amount of victims that you're going to have to process through. How does this whole concept function, right? So let's talk about from a real world perspective, because, you know, when we talk about RTF and response and things, what happens in training should mimic what's going to happen in the real world. You know, it's going to be the call is going to go out for active shooter, whether it's through social media and eventually the cops are going to get dispatched to it. And that first arriving officer is going directly in the building, going after the shooter, because that's his job in this chain of active shooter is to take down the, the person creating the victims. So once the fire side arrives and the first responders and the EMS role, the best way to do it is grab an officer that might be outside the building. And that is going to be your security to get inside. Put your helmet on, your bulletproof vest, and you're going to move together inside. And that warm zone is the place that's already been cleared, those places where the officer's already passed. He's going to provide security for you. If you can get two guys, one can provide rear security, as you saw in those other pictures. You had front and rear security. I'll show you a slide here, too. You want to have ballistic gear when you're moving inside this, this situation. Um, some guys would have a little bit of hesitancy to moving into a scenario like this. The easy way to explain it is we're firefighters, right? We go into buildings that are on fire. It's an unsecured environment, so we have that fire gear to protect us. This is an unsecured environment as well. We have that helmet and ballistic vest to protect us as well. You know, there's, is there a chance you can get hit by a round or something? Eh, possibly, but it's going to be pretty low at this point by the time you are actually making entry into the, to the active scene. It's good if you can get an active shooter back together, have some basic stuff in it, tourniquets and hemostatic agents. That's really all you need. You know, it's going to be what's available and what resources you have. So protective equipment, you know, the minimum you should have, again, it come, I know everybody's working with limited budgets and it's, it's always a battle across the board, no matter where you're at. But I recommend having something with at least level 3A protection. It goes from level one up to four when you talk about body armor. So the helmets as well, they can come in different forms. And make sure it's actually ballistic, not the Chinese plastic one that you get on Amazon. You know, just be aware of that. These helmets that we're wearing in these picture are the exact same thing as this. The only difference is that we just had camouflage covers on ours. No, no real difference between the two. And I also recommend putting something on the front of the vest. How this says rescue task force, not so much for that. Yeah, that helps. You can put a sticker on it. But it identifies that's the front of the plate carrier. Because in the, the front and back look very similar. The only thing is that I want you to, to recognize in that is that if you put it on backwards, the plate carrier is not going to sit properly on your chest. So it just takes a few extra seconds out of the thought process when you're in the moment that you don't have to figure out, okay, which is the front and the back. The seconds equals time and time equals life as these people are bleeding outside and you're trying to make a move inside. We are going back to the different threat levels here with these plates. These uh, level three will stop up to a 762 round. That's what your AK 47 shoot. Uh, it also stopped 556. Five, That's what these AR rifles will shoot. And as a medic, I had, they gave me the crappiest rifle. I think my, my, my rifle was like from Vietnam or something. I'm holding a breaching shotgun there. And the other takeaway from that is right there on my chest is a pair of scissors that I always use to expose the injuries and see what I was working with. This was an Iraqi guy here. He's got an AK 47, the Iraqi National Guard. Um, and these were a couple of the Marines that I was working with. These are flexi cuffs that we had too. But it's all about the protective equipment. If you can get it, if it's available for you. One takeaway too with these plates, we have steel plates on our fire trucks. Everybody's like ceramic versus steel, you know, back and forth. They both work. The big thing is with the ceramic plates is they can get damaged when they're riding inside of a fire truck. If they're getting bounced around in a vehicle, those ceramic plates can actually break. 
the steel plates will do work just as well. And it, you want to make sure they're adjustable as well because you have different, like people are different body types if it's not your own personal stuff. Again, back to train how you fight because uh, when the stuff hits the fan, this is, this is where it comes down to play. And uh, you need to be able to, to function under stress and under fire wearing this type of gear. Your medical equipment, keep it limited. You don't have to have 50,000 pieces of medical equipment, all this fancy stuff. Keep it simple. What are you trying to do? Your primary focus is stop the bleeding, get them stabilized and get them out. You know, we're not saving lives at the EMS level. The surgeons are doing that in the hospital. We're just preserving life. So you want to do the most amount of good. If you spend a whole bunch of time wrapping up just minor cuts and gunshot wounds to the hand, non-life-threatening injuries, now other people are bleeding out that you could be treating. That's just things to keep in the back of your mind. But these are some simple stuff here, and we'll talk about this as we get more into it. So the RTF movement, to put it in a picture form for you, um, you know, the guys in the red, obviously the firefighters, you are unarmed. You know, some guys talk about, well, how about having armed first responders in the incident? There's a lot of responsibility and rely in uh, liability that comes with carrying a weapon. That's why sworn officers need to carry the weapon. Your protection is going to be a police officer, and that's going to be a security detail. Simple way to explain this is, you know, they're driving the bus and your passengers on the bus. As the EMS personnel, the rescue task force, you are the passengers on that bus. You tell the bus drivers, the two police officers with you, hey, we need to stop. We have a victim here and they'll stop and provide security. And they say, okay, we're ready to go again and drag your victim with you or, you know, affect the rescue, whatever you need to do as a rescue task force. But that's your, that's kind of how to explain that part of it. So communication, this is big. The police and the fire, again, two different languages. Our guys, some, are, some departments still use 10 codes. You know, fireside is predicated on incident command. When we arrive at an incident, we set up incident command first, and then we respond to the incident. That's how the fireside works. We're very, very good at incident command and getting resources, especially in this state. So it's very easy for us to call for other resources that we might need. We need more engines, we need more rescues. It's just a quick call on the radio and that task force is sent out to us. The police side, it's completely different. They have no, they just operate differently. When they arrive on a scene, it's usually a sole officer responding into the call and he calls dispatch for his, for his communication. There's no real command side. The best way going forward with your agencies is to put the two commands together. We have our battalion chief with all the maps and things, and it's better to have both the police and fire standing directly next to each other. You can verbally say, hey, I need more rescues or, you know, my, I've got a wounded cop in there and, or what he's seeing He's because he's going to be talking on his frequency. And you can hear that radio chatter as the incident commander. And you also know if the shooter's down, you know, the fire side, you're more worried about the patients and the police side is more worried about securing the scene and making sure the scene is actually secure. They're searching victims, they're searching the shooter, uh, you know, looking for other shooters and trying to get control of that, that whole environment. You know, so it's better to have them together. Situational awareness is key too with this type of stuff, especially when you're under fire or in a high threat environment like this. There's gonna be so many things happening. You know, we talk about having protocol for this or that. This all becomes a gray area and you're gonna to have to make decisions in a split second. You know, I was 20, I think it was like 21 when I first went into combat and I was forced to make decisions that would change the rest of my life and stick with me for the rest of my life. And you are gonna be faced with those same things and same incidents and uh, same choices to make. So we talk about casualty collection point. This was big for us, especially in the urban environment. We have a very high casualty rate in any type of armed conflict in a building. There's many different angles, doors, windows you know when you're fighting a force on force there's these guys in these trenches and these guys in those trenches they're shooting back and forth urban environment it's a much much higher casualty rate and when you look at a doorway here we call that the fatal funnel like the battle of fallujah is really where this fatal funnel the casualty collection point really developed from because as we made entries into these buildings they were stacked up in a room waiting for us they had a machine gun point this would cut us down like cut us down like hay in a field it was it was horrific and devastating to deal with. Our response to that was throw a flashbang and a hand grenade in and try to disorient, maim, and then make entry into the room. And, uh, you know, it was, it was 
it's a lot different when it's when it's your own people. Um, just to speak to like the psychological part of this stuff, you know, as EMS and first responders, we respond to these crazy incidents and their patients to us. But when it's one of your own, the guy that's sitting at the coffee table next to you, and for me over there, it was a guy that I was sitting next to eating chow five minutes ago. Now I'm middle of the gunfight and, you know, I'm taking care of what's left of him. I'm putting him in a trash bag. And it, it mentally debilitates you to do your job. It takes you out of the fight because it really humanizes you. Uh, you know, again, over there, we, we thought we were, you know, we were great fighters and great at what we did. We had more firepower and more, uh, you know, we would always win the day and win the fight. Like you saw in that beginning video, those officers responded into that scenario. They had better firepower, better gear. They were totally outnumbered the shooter. But when those rounds started coming through the door, they were brought down to that human level of like, holy crap, this is real. You know, you can train all you want and do everything under the sun, but nothing prepares you for the real thing. And the psychological part of that is you have to push past. You have to stay in the fight and you got to stay, uh, keep a level head when you're dealing with these type of things and make decisions in the moment. I guarantee you it's going to be like, you're going to be like, holy crap, is this really happening right now? And you got to push past that and make decisions. You know, we talk about this casualty collection point thing. It should be near the fight. And I'm not saying you have to have one, but normally what I would do in my, in my situations in the war is when we made entry into a building, I would use that first room that was, because I knew it was clear, and I would drag my victims, my patients, my Marines into that first room, and I was able to treat them there. I kind of, you know, spread out my, my resources of what I had. I would also have them do self-aid and buddy aid. You know, other victims could hold pressure on a gunshot wound and um, they could treat themselves as well. Yep, the casualty collection point could also be the room that the shooter is taken down in. Like with Uvalde, for example, you know, all the victims were in that one room. That could be a casualty collection point. And they don't have to stay there. It's just a point to get more uh, victims treated. And you can also affect the rescue. If there's doors, if you've got a clear access route out that, if you look at this picture right here, you've got security all the way down that hallway. If there's walking wounded or victims in that hallway, and you've got a clear exit, send them right out the door. You have rescues out there waiting for them, and they can take them to the next higher level of care. Just don't get bottlenecked is the point I'm trying to get at. So quick touch on drags and carries. This becomes a real problem when you're dealing with unconscious, pa unconscious patients. Uh, I'll show you a video here in a second of a, a quick uh, drag that you can use. It's using a basic nylon rope. You know, what firemen are great at this type of stuff. And the other one, too, that I want to show you, I don't really have a video of, is this piece of nylon rope that I have here. It's a six-foot piece, and all you have to do is a simple girth hitch over the, over the arm. I'm going to stop this top one here for a second and see if it'll, uh, let's see, stop sharing. Give me a second. Stop video. Select Joey. I don't know. It's not going to, I don't think it'll let me. But anyways, put it over the arm or leg, whatever it might be, just a simple nylon loop, just a big circle right here, right? See that nylon loop? It's like about three feet long. And all you have to do is put it over an extremity, just strap it over, grab the two lengths in behind it here and pull tight. And now you have a drag. So you can drag this person right out of the scene, out of the, out of the, the gunfire, whatever it might be. And you don't need a whole bunch of people to do that type of uh, drag. And here's a hasty harness, or called the halo loop. Very simple way to uh, affect the rescue. Using a nylon hook. Step one, place webbing in a circular loop around casualty. Step two, grab webbing at the six o'clock position and pull it to their chest while sliding the webbing under their feet. Step three, reach through the resulting loop at their chest to the three o'clock and nine o'clock positions while going under their arms to grab the outer loop. Step four, pull toward the 12 o'clock position, creating two handles and the completion of the hasty harness. That's it, that's it, that's all it takes. It's super, super simple to do. Quick, effective, uh, hasty harness for you to use there. Let me switch this over. There we go. Here's what happens when you have a unconscious patient. You're taking four officers out of the fight to drag this patient out of the scene. This is during, this was, um, not Uvalde, this was uh, okay, Virginia Tech. 
So one big takeaway here from this picture specifically is you can see the right there on his leg. That's actually a windlass. So an officer responded to the scene here, saw the gunshot wound to the femoral artery. You can see the large amount of blood loss up here on the T-shirt. And that's actually a drumstick. Somebody on the SWAT team thinking outside the box made a windlass out of a drumstick and a T-shirt and affected a good tourniquet out of that. And But the other takeaway from this is four guys are being utilized to carry this one victim. You know, the kid probably weighs 180 pounds. You know, when we train, everybody stiffens up, makes it easier to carry. But, uh, you know, that that's anywhere that we're training, trying to help each other out. But the initial goal of the RTF, you're trying to do the most amount of good for the most amount of people. Stop the bleeding is what you're going after. Um, you can use second RTF teams are available. The way we do it in our department is, is our truck assignments are teams. Rescue One has two, two uh, firefighters on it. An engine has three firefighters and a ladder has four. Those are RTF teams. We have body arm on there. We respond to the scene. We can jump out and stay together as a truck for accountability and we'll find an officer and make entry into the building and start uh, working as, as a uh, rescue task force. You know, you want to stabilize the victim by putting targets on, position them, and then move on. You can tell them to walk, run, crawl out of the building, and think outside the box. Just like that, you see there with the windlass being used. So once the RTF's established, as you can see, we have our fire command here and the police side. Everybody's kind of working together, trying to figure out what resources are needed. They had, they're using a whiteboard there, and actually started raining that day. All the stuff on the whiteboard got washed away. Um, you might need an external casualty collection point based on how many victims you have. Stabilize them out in the parking lot. That's going to be a super secure area. Um, you can have other RTF assets, non-RTF assets doing the transfer stuff, the rescue, getting a bus there if you got a bunch of patients, and even using police cars as rescues to get people to the hospital to that high level of care. The big takeaway, too, from here is the flow needs to continue. We saw those bottlenecks with Uvalde. We saw them with some of the other major incidents. And once the bottleneck begins, they turn into roadblocks and then nothing happens. Everybody starts second guessing themselves and everything. Well, what do you want to do about this? And let me call this guy and see what he says. It just goes into a back and forth. Small unit leadership needs to happen at these levels. You know, somebody has got to take charge when you pull up on that scene and say, hey, let's go. We're rescue task force. Let's make this happen. Let's get in there and get in the fight. Under fire, under stress, my second tour, we had a lot of more advanced fighters that were fighting against in the battle after the battle of Fallujah. It was 2005. We had uh, fighters from Ramadi. So these guys were a little bit more advanced. And the Marines I was with, it was their first time being in combat. We got engaged by a machine gun one day. And once we started taking fire, I immediately began to return fire, right? We're under fire. And one of the Marines looked at me. He's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm shooting. <laughs> I was like, shoot back. Like, what are you doing? Like the Marine just caught in the moment. Somebody that's a military, military trained Marine was caught in the moment of, is this really happening right now? That's shocking off. But you got to take charge and step forward and say, hey, this is what we're going to do and how we're going to affect our plan. So you might need other RTS. Depends on, again, number of victims, casualties, and things like that. You know, um, getting the victims out and you can leapfrog that other RTS that's in the building. It's just stuff to take away. Just get the thought process rolling for these for these types of incidents. Once all the victims are out, now you wanna move into a standby role. Stay by the command vehicle, somewhere where they can find you, just in case, you know, because sometimes you'll find victims hidden near in closets, behind doors, uh, other locations throughout the building that might've gotten overlooked and might've gotten skipped because of that run, hide, fight concept. So they're trying to hide in different locations from the shooter. So start to finish of all this. So the active shooter call, call goes out. You know, they, the active shooter begins. These police officers here are clearing the building. And then you have the RTF coming in behind them. We got security behind them and they're kind of driving the bus, directing them where to go. And there's bodies and there's an IED there on the floor. And you got that RTF formed and they're moving to the contact teams. Get a casualty collection point going. And normally they will not move into uncleared areas, the RTF, because you want the cops to go in there first, clear the area. So it's safe and you guys can move in and start treating victims. There's usually going to be a line of victims wherever the shooter went into the, into the building. So now let's talk about some of the things you're going to face in these environments. Hostile fire, obviously, you know, friendly fire as well. But let's don't choose sides. We like to talk about this in the way of, 
the so we have the police and the fire in the military in Iraq in Afghanistan we had army and marine corps completely different radio frequencies completely different operating procedures it was like black and white you know oil and water once again we shot at each other more times than i can count the only way we knew we were shooting at each other is the bad guys usually shot green tracers and we shot red so if there was red ones coming at us, it was usually the army on the end, other end of that weapon. You know, we had the escalation of force. It was, we'd wave at the whatever vehicle we were looking at, shoot a, a flare up, and then shoot a warning shot. And that warning shot was kind of like, all right, what color was that? And to know if it was a good guy or a bad guy. If the person kept coming, then we would engage the vehicle. And you know the result of that. Darkness. 75% of these shootings occur at night, a lot of times with the police shootings. And the environmental extremes especially up here in the north, you deal with the cold, the heat, the building design. You know, this buildings weren't designed for active shooter type incidents. You know, what are the walls made of? You know, the hallways, things are always presenting challenges that you're going to face and affecting your rescues as well. You're going to be faced with challenges, you know, fences, highway shootings. It doesn't just have to be active shooters. It could be responding to a downed officer, you know, limited medical equipment. The one thing you always need is a short supply, you know, we talk about having these active shooter bags and all this great equipment, but when you deal with multiple uh, casualties like that, you're going to get overwhelmed very, very quickly. One second, one trigger pull. You know, how long does it take for your response to get to the scene? How many victims are you going to come upon? That's when really coming and thinking outside the box, which we'll talk about later, is going to come into play. Um, Pacers dying, mission needs to continue. And that comment there with the tackle maneuver, I put that in there because Patient is your priority. You know, is the person bleeding out? Have they lost so much blood to the point where you need them to get to the next higher level of care? We talk about in our EMS world now, especially this whole doing 30 minutes on scene for CPR, right? For a cardiac arrest, we spend 30 minutes on scene, seeing better uh, resuscitatory rates with that, right? Train how you fight. What's going to happen is guys going to get caught up in the moment with these active shooters of, you know, I got to spend 30 minutes here with this guy that's bleeding out. You need to get that victim to the next higher level of care. You got to get them to the hospital. The whole stay and play, load and go. The load and go is what is important in that aspect. And that's a choice you have to make, again, at the, the lowest level, you know, the small unit leadership. Mission needs to continue. You know, can you do anything for that victim? As EMS providers, again, we're so predicated on treating the first victim we come across. You may have to pass down kids, you know, kids that are that there's nothing you can do for them, a gunshot wound to the face where there's no signs of life and move on to somebody else. And that's, that's a hard choice to make. Um, it's, it's, it's very debilitating mentally to be able to make that choice because it's something you're always gonna think about. Um, long delays of hospital care, radio's out of range. We have those problems all the time with like, with the, in Fatima, we try to get repeaters and things. Guys that are out in the woods, especially some of your responders that are way out in Burrowville and some of these other locations, far from hospitals, EMS, or you're pinned down under fire, you know, scene's not secure. There's all different things that could lead up to long delays in getting that person to the hospital. Different medical training experience, that's pretty standard across the board. So ABCs, remember that? We talked about that for years, uh, airway, breathing, circulation, um, you know, disability, neuro, exposure, environment, put some blankets on the person when we take like, the diabetic emergency, you know, grandma fell out of bed, your general everyday calls. That's kind of what that's speaking to. In a gunfight or in one of these active shooter environments, if you become a victim or you're injured, especially for these responders, you know, get your ass to cover and keep fighting, especially for first responder, armed first responder, and get your ass out of the line of fire, essentially, is what that's saying. You know, get off the ass. You've heard that many times. Your number one primary focus now is circulation. The whole eight, because you don't need airway and breathing if you have no blood in your body. There's no fluid in the container. There's no point for airway and breathing at that point. Get that under control. Use the tourniquets and and uh, hemostatic gauge, which we'll talk about more here. Can you walk and move on your own? You know, self-rescue. Expose what you need to. I always carry those scissors. You saw, I'll show you some of the other pictures too as we get into it. It's especially with, um, you know, cutting, exposing the injuries. Because what I found with, especially with small, high velocity rounds like 5.56 five, six, or 7.62, a lot of the victims I treated over there, it would be a small entry wound through the clothing and then there would be no blood. Because what happens is as that bullet travels into your body, it's, it's creating and generating a lot of heat. So it cauterizes the wound and also creates massive cavitation. It's like throwing a rock in the mud. You see that big expansion? 
Same thing happens with the bullets. And a lot of times you're in such a rush, it's easy to look over things and you're, you're just looking around the body real quick. Well, I don't see any holes in them. So I'm just going to continue on, you know, take those few extra seconds. So expose what you're working with. And, um, and it, it, one of the things that happened in the initial days of Iraq was we came under a heavy mortar attack. So mortars are just like fireworks. You hear that thump from the tube. That's what a mortar is, how that's fired. They drop it down a tube. It comes out, it flies at a horizontal rate, comes straight down, and then the thing explodes on the ground, sending shrapnel in all different directions. So what had happened was I was treating a casualty that had most of his arm torn off. He'd been blown off by one of these mortars, and I brought him over to the medevac site, and there were six tubes firing out, six mortar tubes, and it was over um, 50 mortar rounds impacted the base, 120 millimeter, and the casualties were just unbelievable. It was, only 30, it was over 30 wounded that day and uh, uh, six killed. But during, at the medevac site, there was Black Hawk helicopters stacked up in the sky. You know, one would come in, we'd load four patients on it, you'd take off. Another one would land, load four patients on it, take off. And it, we were relieving the army at the time. And one of the victims, nobody was treating him. So he's just laying there, right? And I walked over to him and ABCs, right? Check the airway, no pulse, no breathing, start CPR. I pushed down on the guy's chest. His chest sank in, but didn't come back up. I'm like, it just wasn't registering, you know? Normally you press down, it comes right back up. So I opened his blouse and his whole chest looked like Swiss cheese. There was all these little black dots, but no blood. Because I more it landed right in front of him, killed him instantly, and just completely deflated his lungs. But that was always a takeaway for me about, there was no blood. It wasn't like the movies where there was blood all over the place. And, it, you know, it was easy to identify the wounds. But there was all little burn marks in that shrapnel. Boss, let's put this explosion there. Keep, keep me awake. But uh, TCCC, again, back to those the leading causes of death. We talk about hemorrhage from the extremity, right? Gunshot wounds, that's all we think about with active shooter. They can happen from stab wounds, too. Injuries from car accidents. There's an endless number of ways you can get a bleed out from an extremity. One of those things, too, big with the motorcycle culture. They have big knife culture. They like to stab for the armpits, the groin, hell's angels. You'll find... Uh, they like to use the uh, tampons because tampons work really good. That was originally what we used for gunshot wounds and stuff prior to having hemostatic agents. They're designed to absorb blood. They swell up and they work decently well at stopping, uh, you know, arterial. No, not so much arterial bleed, but they'll, they'll stop a bleed pretty well. And it's something. Tension pneumos, it's developed, it's developed spontaneously. They have the runners, they can break away from the chest wall. Air builds up in there and more of what you're worried about in these situations is sucking chest wounds. Blunt trauma as well, car accidents. Even if you have those threat plates, right? You've got that armor on and you get shot by one of these rounds, the plates are gonna stop the bullets, but that's like getting hit by a car because of that kinetic energy that that bullet has striking the plate. And most likely it's gonna break some ribs and it's gonna damage your chest and you can easily develop a tension pneumo from that. It takes a little bit while to develop, that air builds up in there and we'll talk about that later but it's, it's very fixable at the paramedic level. And it's good to be aware of it. Airway problems, blunt force trauma, stab wounds, gunshot wounds, choking victims, and allergic reactions. They're all stuff that can happen along with these active shooter incidents. But always gonna be that bleed out. It's your primary major concern. When you're treating, especially downed officers with an altered mental status, be aware of the hands, where they're at, because it's easy for once you become wounded like that and you start to lose blood, you go into shock very quickly and the person takes on an altered mental status. And a lot of times they try to re-engage what they were doing just before they were, went unconscious. And my second tour, we got hit by a large improvised explosive device. And it was very common for us to get hit by these, but this one was a complex ambush. And one of the, the Marines were out of the vehicle when the second one detonated. And one of them was burnt head to toe. His, his initial flash burned his eyes and his face and he lost visual and was starting to go into shock. He still had his weapon in his hands and he began to fire, just blind fire because he could hear the gunshots from us shooting at the enemy that was trying to overrun us. So he thought he had no idea what was going on, but he just started trying to engage whatever he could by the sound. So we had to disarm him, take his weapon away before he shot one of us. Um, so it's just something to be aware of when you're running up on these downed officers and it could be, Something is not even active shooter, just a, a simple domestic that went bad or a car accident, whatever it might be, it went bad. 
but that officer might be trying to go for his weapon. So just be aware of where their hands are and have another officer secure that weapon. You know, they might think you're a threat and it could be anything from tasers, firearms, and other things can cause that. A head injury, shock, pain, medications they might be on, hypoxia, which is oxygen loss to the brain. They got choked out or something. Burn prevention, pretty straightforward, right? Move the person out of the structure, out of the, uh, out of the, the get them under cover and stop the burning process. We have stuff called isogel, which is like this burn gel. That works very well with treating burns. And what happened here, it's back to that good thing the world, you know, professionals are predictable. Good thing the world is full of amateurs. Most of these guys were amateur bomb builders. And this was a suicide bomber. And when he tried to detonate his device, the initial charge to set off the explosives went off, but not the, the rounds themselves. So he ended up burning up outside his vehicle. They can see our base and, and the structure that was he was trying to enter. And any type of gunfight, right? Any type of active shooter incident your number one priority is gonna be getting that bleeding under control. It's gonna be that preventable cause of death in this environment. You know, it quickly will lead to shock and death. And if you aren't bleeding to death, especially a first responder or a gunfighter, keep fighting. You know, we've seen these videos. You can go on the internet anywhere and see these downed officer videos when the shooter engages the officer, knocks him down and he comes in and the officer's begging for his life and he comes in and finishes the job. You know, if you get injured, get back in the fight. That's the, the best thing I can say about that. And stop them from bleeding to death. How long does it take to bleed to death, right? From a complete artery dissection. Just a quick warning. You know, this next video is going to be a little bit bloody if, uh, based on your audience who might be around you. So this is an arterial bleed. The reason why we use pigs is because they are the most similar human structure to us. So they had similar types of veins, arteries, and uh, organs. So that's why they worked as the best uh, subject to use to test out this, these methods on. The big takeaway from this uh, right here is that the pig's knocked out. The blood pressure is normal, the pulse is normal, and look how fast that blood loss is being created. You know, that's a femoral artery that, that's been cut down on and no treatment is being provided. The other thing is, too, is how easily that wound is exposed. That's a full cut down that you can see the actual point of bleeding. The majority of what you're going to be dealing with, you're going to have to pack these wounds to get down in there to make an effective uh, stop on the bleed. So it takes, all it takes is three minutes. And you'll be unconscious within a minute. That's all it takes. Um, you know, 10% of these lab animals died with three minutes without any control. Tourniquets. These things have saved many lives in the battlefield. The one on the left here is a cat tourniquet. It's an awesome piece of gear. I got one here, and they're a little bit bigger in size. The SWAT T wasn't around during our time in the early days of the war, but it's a great, great dressing to use as well. So some of the case studies. Oh, sorry, my kids are upstairs. Uh, in 2006, Baghdad was kind of our central hub for our hospitals where our patients would go. They found that got, tourniquets were saving lives in the battlefield. It was better if it was before the casualty went into shock, so the guy was injured, and they immediately put the tourniquet on, and 31 lives were saved in this study. Also in 2008, another combat support hospital in Baghdad, 232 patients with tourniquets on 309 limbs. Especially with blast injuries, there was always multiple points of entry with these. We found that cat tourniquet was the best uh, tourniquet available. SWAT team wasn't out there. And the reason why I put that out there is you want to get a good quality tourniquet. How much is your life for it? Cat tourniquet's about 30 bucks. Great piece of gear. SWAT tees, I think, are 10, 10, 20 bucks, something like that. Very cheap to buy. Um, but buy a quality tourniquet because there's a lot of fakes on the market. And when you need it, it's not going to work. You know, a big, especially for the older people in the class here, you remember, you know, tourniquets were the thought process was you put a tourniquet on, person's losing that limb automatically, you know, no amputations are caused by tourniquet use. We had 3% transient nerve paralysis. These things were being left on for hours out there because our transport times are so long. You know, we had 232 lives saved in this one hospital in a one year period. The war went on for 20 years. You know, minimal complications from tourniquet use. When you're putting the stuff on, it's gonna be your first choice, um, hemorrhage control, apply without delay, you know, put this thing out right away. When in doubt, use the tourniquet, what I like to say. You know, um, you are in danger, especially if you're a, a 
you know, an armed first responder, get out of the line of fire. I found this all the time teaching T triple C because we would shoot paintballs at them. We had an unlimited budget. So we were we had smoke grenades, a bunch of crazy corpsmen out there screaming at them, like just trying to sensory overwhelm it for the student because we wanted to put every stressor on them we could as possible. And what we found is that the student knew, okay, it's a tourniquet station. I got to come up here and apply a tourniquet. They would immediately start applying the tourniquet under fire, even though they were still getting hit by paintballs, which sting when you're not under stress, but under that stress, they didn't even realize they were getting hit. Like us screaming at them wasn't even registering because you get hyper-focused on what you're doing. You know, you got to risk that for the risk of bleeding to death or, you know, life over limb. That's what, because people are like, ah, I put the tourniquet on, like, you know, the life over limb concept. You don't want to live with the, you know, all these developments in, in uh, prosthetics are just amazing. You know, I, I said, if I always said, if I lost my leg, I want to get a peg leg so I could drink beer out of it. <laughs> but uh, damage is, is rare. You know, we leave them on for hours during surgery and you got to accept that risk, you know, see what's, you're going to risk that guy bleeding to death or um, possibility damage to the limb. And again, 232 people were saved in that one hospital because tourniquets were used. You know, how many people have died because tourniquet wasn't used. Some of the points in applying these things, you should ignore non-life threatening bleeding. I'll show you some pictures of that. It's pretty straightforward. Apply a tourniquet without removing the uniform and putting it above the bleeding site. That was another one I found a lot. I put these points in here because these are failures that I saw. And then tightening it until bleeding is controlled. Crank that thing down. Another one that we found with students is that they would put the tourniquet on but not crank it down enough. They hurt when you put tourniquets on. They don't feel good. In the uh, basic dynamic, in the basic anatomy 101, let's see if I can stop this for a second, is, you should be able to see me on the big screen here. Basic anatomy 101 is your arteries run deep inside the muscle tissue. So basic anatomy, you have one bone up here, you have two bones down here. So when you put your tourniquet on, always go high on the extremity. So it's one less thing to think about. And you're not going to be over the injury site. You're not going to be over bulky items, anything like that. Just go high, high on the extremity. And that's going to be the best point for your tourniquet use. Here's a cat tourniquet. Very simple. This time thing on here that you see on these, don't worry about that. Time is not really an issue. Because as these incidents unfold, there's going to be time stamps to it from the dispatch. And the hospital just wants to know that the person has a tourniquet. It's just time wasted. So you can slip it up over an extremity, put it high up, pull the Velcro tight. This was just blue because it's a training one. Not about much difference. And then crank down the windlass till the bleeding stops. Spinning it around here, and then you lock it in on itself. There you go, locked in. Now bleeding is under control. I can get back in the fight. Or you can move on to treating your next victim if you're working as an RTF. SWAT T, another one made out of rubber. Guy made out of a bicycle inner tube is how this was developed. Very simple. They come in this package here. It's very, very small. It's compact. You see how thin that is? You can put it in behind your gear, and it's easy to carry. We use them a lot. We have a whole bunch of them in our active shooter bags. But same concept, right? We go high in the extremity from applying it to myself. I'm wrapping it around. You're just getting it nice and tight on the extremity. It's creating good constriction there. So you can tuck it in on itself, because that's what it stands for, stretch, wrap, and tuck. Or you can just hold it like that. You just keep it, your arm tucked in, and it's staying on itself. Very, very simple to use. Put off my circulation, my own arm. Yeah. Same thing with the leg. Go high in the extremity and crank that thing down until bleeding is controlled. So we can share my screen again. There we go. Perfect. So that's tourniquet use, basic tourniquet use for these two types of tourniquets. Awesome, awesome piece of gear. Um, the size difference, we used to carry these on our shoulders because of the blast injuries. I try to teach and preach uniform location because when you come up on a downed victim or downed officer, or especially a first responder, you want to use their equipment first, not yours, because you may need it later on in that situation. So trying to have it in a uniform location um, and getting your cops to put it in a uniform location. Another big one down the bottom there about the circulation. You know, people, they were like, you know, it's going to 
loosen it to allow circulation to the limb. You just cause an unacceptable blood loss at that point. Here's a SWAT T being used as a tourniquet, high in the extremity. You have that single bone up there versus the two below it. So you're going to get better construction. Obviously, the injury was above the elbow here. But you got good construction above the site to act as a good tourniquet. And he's got that one a little bit wider banded. It doesn't matter. As long as it's working as a tourniquet, there's no uh, right or wrong putting it on that way. The other nice thing about the SWAT tees is they work good as a pressure dressing. When you apply these things, if you have a gunshot wound to the neck, um, to the somewhere where you can't get a tourniquet on, or, you, or you're putting a hemostatic agent in, these work as a pressure dressing, so you don't have to sit there and hold it for the three minutes that's required. Some basic injuries, these kind of go without saying, you know, you're still going to get a decent amount of blood loss. And those arteries run deep, deep inside the body. They're right up against the bone. They're not subsurface. When you're dealing with an arterial bleed, it's way down in there. Loves them big. Let's see. Let me show you my. Uh... Not using one when you should. You know, using tourniquet for minimal bleeding, putting it too close to the injury, taking it off when the person's in shock or has a short transport time because they used to go back to that whole well allow some blood flow to the limb. Like you're just causing unacceptable blood loss at that point. Not making it tight enough is another big one. Should eliminate that distal pulse. If you think about it, you know, it's not a have to, but it's just another tool for the toolbox, your tactical toolbox. If you think about it, you can check that pulse and make sure that it's eliminated. Basically, you just want to get the tourniquet on tight enough till the bleeding stops. Not using a second one if you should and waiting too long to put it on. Some places you can use a tourniquet, right? Neck armpits, groin, still places where there's major arteries and where they run through. If you run into that type of situation, that's where the quick clot's going to come into play. Um, it's not tactically possible. So you can, sometimes you have to hold it on there for three minutes at least. I'm going to show you a video here in a second of it being used. And this stuff here is just the uh, sponges. What you are about to see is a complete transection of the femoral artery and vein. This is an injury that is difficult to control in the field as it is not conducive to tourniquet use. After the artery and vein are transected, the subject is allowed to bleed uncontrolled for three minutes to simulate a response time to wound treatment. Two 50 gram bags. Oops bags of quick clot ACS, the advanced clotting sponge, are packed into the wound and direct pressure is applied using a rolled up bandage for three minutes. At 15 minutes, the subject is infused over the next 30 minutes with 500 milliliters of Hextend resuscitation fluid and the clot does not dislodge. After removing the bandage, the two sponges are removed easily from the wound. You can see the strength of the clot as it is probed by the surgeon. So that's the quick lot sponge there. I'll show you here real quick on, let's see, stop here, okay. So now the hemostatic agent in that one was just a quick lot sponge made by the same company here. And this is what the training ones look like in the blue package. They're just packaged in different forms. That's a Z-fold gauze right there on the same company, Z-Medica, um, all wonderful pieces of gear. Another takeaway from this is, like I was saying, seconds count is life. So when you're looking at this, you see the little, Tear uh, preparations there, one here, one here, and how they're all sides of the package. Because in the moment when you're under fire, under stress, 
opening up a simple package becomes difficult. You're fighting with it, and it happened to me many times. Just trying to get a piece of curl like bandage open was, was a nightmare under fire, like just under that high pressure stress. Like I'd done it a thousand times before as a corpsman, wrapping somebody up was super simple, but these normal operations became difficult. But when you open one of these up and look inside of it here, it comes in a Z-fold formation. You can see how that's stacked in there. And the reason for that is, is it makes it easier to pack into the wound. That blue line that you see is for an X-ray so they can find it inside the body. Got my little wound cube here. And it's, these are just basically different entry points and um, different ballistics of what bullets do to you. And it's just for the point of packing. So when you're putting this stuff into somebody, you have to pack it to the point of bleeding. You really got to force it down into the wound. You can use one hand to pack it in while you're feeding it in from that Z-fold formation. And you got to get it down to the bleeding site. You got to get all the way down in there. It's going to hurt the victim. Are they going to like it? No, absolutely not. It's going to, it's going to hurt them, but it's, uh, it's to save their life, essentially. And once you get it in there, you can have them hold it for three minutes, or you can use a pressure dressing, whatever you need to. Have another person that's there um, you know, provide pressure for them as well. But there's a bunch of different types of this on the market, but this is probably the best one I've found. There's a sponge version of it. And um, there's some other types of bandages as well. You know, back when I was working with this stuff in the military, I was using a four by four, a roll of Curlex gauze, and then an ace wrap. And that was my bleeder pack, essentially. And the stuff we had was the powder form, which is out of circulation. If any of you guys have that stuff still, it's not being used anymore. It's expired. It was made out of shrimp shells. And it has a burning agent in it, too. If you've never used it before, it burn the crap out of it. It worked well for what it was in the initial... Uh, initial part of the war there and when we were dealing with these types of incidents but we finally developed it into this form now to where it is no longer uh, an organic substance with the shrimp shells it's now made out of um a i forget the exact terminology for it was but it's a synthetic uh agent inside there and it amplifies your clotting factors to build that tenacious clot inside the injury there you go so field expedience this comes into play, especially with when you're under, when you have limited resources, you know, again, I'm talking to all different agencies here. I don't know what your limitations are, what you might have available. And you could run into a situation where, especially for the volunteer world, when you're responding in your personal vehicle, you know, use things that you are around you, think outside the box. And, you know, uh, tourniquets can be made out of just about anything, just using a basic windlass. Uh, you can make that out of a, a stick, for example, and that works as a windlass, a t-shirt and a stick. There's so many different things that can work as an effective uh, tourniquet and uh, also pressure dressings as well. You know, we talk about things that are around you for officers. You can use a, a pistol magazine, works as a good windlass. Uh, seat belts, AD pads are number one for when you look at ADs, right? They're all over our major places, libraries, schools, and things like that. Designed to stick to a wet, sweaty chest, right? Works great for a sucking chest wound, you know, entry wound, exit wound, slap that AED pad on there. Here is a fancy version of that with no leads attached to it. And these are called halo seals. They're just, they're pretty cheap on the market. But what I found with these is when we were in Iraq during a tour there, we had a sniper position set up and they took down a, a suspect that was a, he was basically a scout for the IEDs. The guys would come in and set the IEDs. They would show up in a van. The bottom of the floor of the van was cut out and they would just shove the artillery shells out of put through that hole in the van into the hole and that would be the IED, IED emplacement and then they would just drive off and it was a quick setup and we kept getting attacked in the same area the same intersection constantly with these IEDs so we sent a sniper team out there for overwatch they shot a um a insurgent out there and they sent us out there to go pick up the body because the sniper team stays in place so we went out there with that little detachment. We found the guy behind a building, big old hole in his chest, subsonic 308 round from what they were using for rifles. And uh, it put a giant hole in his chest. And I was like, oh, well, training time, you know, this guy's on his way out. So we used the Ashman chest seal. It has a one-way valve on it, stuck it on his chest, but it wouldn't stick because of the wet sweatiness. And like there was some blood and fluid starting to build up there from the, the, the actual injury site. Couldn't get it to stick. So Marines love to eat. And they always eat MREs, right? So they come in these bags that look like this and cut a square out of it and use duct tape because Marines always have duct tape. And we duct tape that to his chest and it worked as a seal. And it worked great for what we were trying to accomplish then. We didn't have AEDs out there in the field, but we ended up using 
literally plastic and duct tape to make our chest seals going forward from that point. And it goes back to thinking outside the box. Another time I had a Marine, he was hitting the spine with shrapnel and I couldn't, I didn't carry seed collars because it was their big plastic. You guys know what seed collars are. And a big piece of plastic, right? And it, it just gets in the way. So it was a piece of gear I didn't think I needed. So I switched it over. I cut the guy's boots off and used that as a seat collar. Put him on his, around his neck there and then just duct tape him around his head to, to stabilize the seat spine. And it, it worked out well um, for what I was trying to accomplish at that point in time. But it just goes back to thinking outside the box. You use what you have available. It's stupid and it works. It really isn't stupid at that point. Slide this switch. There we go. Sticks and rags. This guy stepped on a mine here. This is... You would find this with uh, like Iraqi soldiers and things. You know, we had all the great medical equipment, but these guys are operating with us, and they were kind of like our yellow canaries in the in the in the coal mine. You know, we'd send these guys out first, and they would probe the area and uh, become the victims. And they would we treat them the same way as we would with ours. Um, you know, this you look at this injury here, and it kind of goes back to show how much damage the body can actually take and still be survivable. You know, we have triple amputees, quadruple amputees coming back from the war on terror. The body is, almost 50% of the body has been completely destroyed and they're still surviving and living on in life. You know, and uh, so why can't we treat, the people like this are surviving, so why aren't, uh, you know, gunshot wound victims and civilians surviving because they're not getting the care right away. But uh, this this guy affected a quick rescue using, these are cravats right here, that, that uh, olive drab looking color, that's what that is, those triangle bandages. Most of you guys have them on the rescue, been around since the beginning of time. And uh, they work very well. Any questions up until this point? Just want to open the floor. I mean, we talked about a lot. We covered a lot. And we're going to keep rolling here. We'll keep moving into some, some other types of things that you're going to be faced with. This guy was, usually this happened to tankers. When uh, the Iraqi tankers, the way the Russian tanks were designed, all the ammunitions are on the turret. They're not protected like we are. So they would we blow up a tank like this is what they would happen to <laughs> I don't see any questions in the chat here. We'll keep moving for time. So explosives, whoops, let's skip the slide here. Kind of went back with it. Blast injuries, big thing with blast injuries. This picture right here depicts the power of an explosive device. What you're looking at here is four inch armored glass. This will stop up to a 50 cal round normally. And this is what's in my second tour here. This is the Humvee that I received the, uh, the award for, you saw in the beginning. Um, that Silver Star incident. And what happened was in this, there was a secondary device set up. And when this thing went off, it took the interpreter's arm off. This piece of shrapnel came through that four inch glass, through the metal of the door and took his arm off. And you can see what's left of it on the, on the door here, right at the shoulder, right at the collarbone. There was nothing I could do for him treatment wise. I couldn't get a tourniquet on it because it wasn't at the left. And I, he lost his arm obviously, but he actually went back to Iraq years later and was an interpreter for, he was from Dearborn, Michigan. His name was Kenny. Like we didn't know how to pronounce his actual name, so we just called him Kenny. But he's like, what do I need an armed interpreter for? You know, it just kind of goes to show what, what the uh, American spirit can do. And, uh, but this, this was a hell of a battle. It was a complex ambush, lost his arm in this blast. And then the real fight started as we are, began to get overrun. So types of explosives. Back to that comment of, you know, good thing the world is full of amateurs. We haven't seen too many explosive devices that have been functional in these active shooter type events. When you look at Columbine, they had IEDs out for the first responders. There was one near the fire hydrant. There was a couple in the, in the parking lot in vehicles because they figured the parking lot was going to fill with first responders, right? Um, you know, and that's exactly what happened. The first responders came into the incident because... Professionals are predictable. Some after shooter happens, we're all coming to the scene. And the good thing was they were amateur made devices. So the things didn't go off, they were just left laying around and uh, didn't detonate. And that, that uh, what was that other one too, with uh, New Zealand. New Zealand had a bunch of, that guy in that video when he live streamed the whole thing, he had IEDs in the back of his trunk that he didn't end up using and forgot about them. But uh, he had made homemade explosives. They're very simple to make. I use some in my training. You know, they're basically cell phone devices. This is your typical PVC pipe bomb that you could build at Home Depot. And the triggering device is a phone because they use that against us a lot of times in Iraq. You think third world countries, guys have no concept of how to build explosives and they were blowing us up left and right. Um, 
And basically, this was the triggering device. This would send a little small shock to the deck cord, and that would set off whatever the deck cord was, would, uh, was attached to. So if you run into these things and type of the building, just be aware of them. You're going to, get to continue on your mission with caring for the victims, but just point them out and be aware of them. You know, you got to take that risk of, you know, is this thing going to detonate at any point in time? But these are some of these are just training types and different uh, detonating, different triggering devices that they might have and you might see. So different types of explosive. Your military grade stuff, right? You look at this picture here in the bottom right. This was a car bomb that we were disabled. A lot of times they fill these things full of explosives. Those are four artillery shells, 155 millimeter shells, kill radius, 100 meters if detonated properly, and there's five of them there. So you can imagine the explosion and the devastation that this would have on a civilian population. The doors of it were filled with uh, composition B, which is another type of explosive. And right here, this water you're seeing. We used an IV bag to blow the receiver out of the vehicle to disable it and uh, and render this this car inert so it wasn't it wouldn't hurt us. But that's the military grade type stuff would be like things like that, artillery shells, hand grenades, things that are manufactured for military use. Your homemade stuff is going to be things like this, like the pipe bombs. You know, homemade in nature, gas cans. Um, you'll you'll see things made out of plastic, and they can range from all different something as small as a Coke can, all the way up to like a large type device that somebody may have developed. Um, we had the Boston bombing, where they use pressure cookers as, as the initiator, and there's many, many different ways to make, make explosives. There's been a lot of plots foiled from that too, when they called in to like a fertilizer company ordering 100 pounds of ammonium nitrate, it kind of raises a red flag. Um, thank goodness a lot of those plots have been foiled. Low explosives, that's considered like your propellants, black powder, fire, fireworks and things, things that really aren't designed to damage and maim. They can be made into high explosive by packing them tighter, but what a high explosive thing is, is like the TNT and um, bigger type explosives. The injuries you're gonna see from this are absolutely horrific. Um, there's no other way to, to put it. Um, you're gonna have your prime, primary blast injuries from this, and. This is the majority of what I dealt with in the, in the war on terror. This hole that this Marine standing in right here was a, an actual dump truck that they filled with explosives. And luckily, no vehicle was close to it when this thing detonated. They just set it off at the wrong time. But this was a lot of the after action of these explosives. And when you get that primary blast, it's that initial shock wave that you can't see when the device goes off. It's an invisible wave of air that comes out from that blast and will tear the body to pieces. It's usually, it's not much left of the victims. And then also what you're really worried about if you survive, you're in that range is the internal damage that's caused. Because that shockwave goes through your body it damages soft tissue like lungs, your stomach, your liver, spleen, all that stuff can get ripped apart by that invisible shockwave. When my vehicle was struck by the car bomb, we were driving down a road, bright sunny day, I was playing on a laptop, Again, like the movies, I mean, not like the movies where this dramatic music before the guy gets blown up, it was just driving along and all of a sudden everything went black. And my gunner, he'd fallen down on top of my lap. His, he'd been hit in the neck and face and he was bleeding out all of my legs. But I thought my legs had been blown off. So I dragged him out of that vehicle in that initial shot and trying to treat what was left of his face. And then the, the passenger had lost half his hand and the, the guy, on my right was had a bunch of shrapnel on his face. But the uh, initial shock of that was, you know, I didn't feel any pain. Like, I didn't feel like I'd been injured because you're just like getting a car accident. You don't feel that. Um, you just feel a surge of, of excitement and a, a surge of adrenaline comes into your body. And if you become injured, take advantage of that surge of adrenaline to either treat yourself or stay engaged in the fight. You know, I didn't realize I had taken some shrapnel on my wrist till probably about an hour after. And it also felt like Somebody took my guts out, threw them on the ground, and put them back in. You know, I fortunately I didn't have any internal bleeding because I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, obviously, if, if uh, I had torn up some some uh, organs. But the truck itself, all that armor, couldn't protect us from that uh, invisible shockwave. The other thing too with the secondary blast, that's going to be your shrapnel from the device. When you talk about from a definition standpoint, when the actual pieces of the car, the pieces of the artillery shell the pieces of whatever the IED is made out of, that's going to cause your secondary ones. And tertiary 
is going to be when the body is thrown through the air and what do you land on? That's considered tertiary injuries. But the debilitating factor to this is, is the injuries. When you see these things, and one, one big takeaway from all of this is the voices. When I heard them, you know, calling for help, like the first couple of days we were there, we get hit by a large IED, blew up under the vehicle, and it, the three, four Marines that were back there were just cut to pieces, literally cut to hamburger meat. And when I got up to that vehicle, we'd done training many, many times, right? Just like how we do these active shooter events. You know, people are screaming, oh, help, help, you know, EMT, you know, they're, they're calling your name and stuff. And it's, there's that tinge of training to it. But when it's the real thing, those voices have a completely different sound to them. And when they're calling for help and calling for you to, to come rescue them, your body just wants to quit. It's like you just want to hit the reset button and call, you know, say index, you know, it's, it's all over. And you have to push past that. And I'll never forget when I opened the back of that truck and there's four guys that I was just talking to 20 minutes before, before we left the base and the blood came out of the back of that truck and all over my pants. And they're screaming for Corman up and doc. And I'm the one they're calling for. I remember getting into that truck and it was like, there was just no time to think. My hands just started working. Like you're doing what you're trained to do. You know, we don't we talk about heroes and all that stuff. There's no heroes in these moments. It's you rise to the level of your training. And whatever you're trained to do is what you're going to do in that moment. And after the incident was over, I had that adrenaline dump. I collapsed on the sidewalk, you know, and my Marines picked me up and they said, Doc, we got to get back in the fight, you know, and that's what you're going to have to face. The world's going to go on after these incidents. You're going to have to get back on the truck and go back to the station and go back on another call, you know, and it's, it's very, very hard to deal with on the mental side and um, trying to, come together as a team and be able to push past that. It's just something else to kind of the process that you're going to have to deal with on the other side of these active shooter events. But moving on to talking about direct pressure, right? It's been around since the beginning of time. Works very, very well. It can stop carotid bleeding and femoral bleeding. You know, it takes two hands, got to lean into it. You know, remember the old don't do the Curious George thing? Like, wow, I stopped the bleeding. Let me check and see what's going on. You pick up your hand and it's just going to cause more bleeding at that point. Um, you know, try to get a tourniquet on the wound ASAP. That's that's the goal of that. So we talk about ABCs, right? A little more in depth with this, the circulation, you know, otherwise known as bleeding. Try to find if you are, especially of an active armed responder, you know, take those few extra seconds to look for the bleeds, you know, do a blood sweep of your hands and it may decide if the person bleeds to death or not. And the reason why I bring this up and I put that, you know, take those few extra seconds is, is that on the, one of my tours, we were set up a security checkpoint and a vehicle drove through it. We did our uh, escalation of force, tried to stop the vehicle. We did the warning shots, but the vehicle kept coming. Initially, we thought it was a suicide bomber. We engaged the vehicle, all five of us. We started shooting at this car. Car crashed into the marketplace. The Marines ran up and secured it, immediately called for me to come treat these victims. Turned out it wasn't a car bomb. It was a father and his two kids just driving through the marketplace got scared because of all the people screaming and stepped on the gas and didn't realize what was in front of him. The son was killed instantly. The one son, the other one was still alive. The driver was still alive though in the vehicle. I went over to that side and bullets do crazy things when they strike the body, especially 5.56 and some of these other rounds. They're designed to bounce off bones. This guy was hit right in the eye socket here and it exited out the side of his skull. He had a large, most of his face was blown off. I took a large Curlex bandage, something similar to this, but that white Curlex bandage that we deal with, and I stuffed it right in its face and started maintaining pressure and establishing an airway. So this victim had an air, good, once I was able to establish an airway, we took him immediately to our shock trauma platoon, which was probably, you know, I don't know, 10 minute drive down the road, was, wasn't very far from our base. Loaded that guy into that shock trauma platoon, and the doc comes back out and he's like, what you bring us a dead guy for? I'm like, what are you talking about? He was alive two seconds ago. And he's like, did you look at his chest? And I was like, no. So he brought me in there. And once again, he opened up his chest there and he pulled away the, the shirt that he was wearing. And there it was, those small little holes through the shirt with no blood. And he's like, this is what killed him, not this. Now, there's probably nothing I could have done for him, you know, looking back. But it was the point as a medical provider, as a corpsman, as a doc, I missed that extra step of I got focused on this, not this. This is what was killing him, not this giant hole in his head. And, you know, could I have done some 
I, there was not much I could have done. He probably would have died anyways based on his injuries. But uh, it was just, I'd have to live with that for the rest of my life. And I try to preach that of taking those few extra seconds could mean the difference between when that person lives or dies. You know, it's easy to get focused. You saw the, the blast injury where the guy lost both of his legs there, right? You get that treated. But does he have injuries to the chest? That's what's killing him. You know, the, the vital organs, you know, that gunshot wound, the chest they may have overlooked. Uh, so just take those few extra seconds. Think outside the box, you know, use those um, AD pads especially. So moving on to, so now we talk about circulation, airway management. Very simple to treat. All you gotta do is put him in the recovery position. You know, again, you're trying to do the most amount of good. Make sure he's got a clear airway, sweep the stuff out of the way, blunt force, shrapnel, whatever. They're gonna have snoring respirations. That's the easiest way if they're having airway problems. And you need to move on to other patients, put them in that recovery position. I teach the cops especially. After the shooter is down, start treating victims and do things like this. You know, if you're not sure why he's snoring, you can't figure out the airway, put them on their side because the fluids are going to drain out of the mouth. They're not going to aspirate on, you know, the vomit and spit and teeth and everything else. So it'll help them just naturally drain out the side. So if you find victims in that position, um, again, recovery position, simple, simple movement for the patient. Breathing. Basically, this is where you get into your sucking chest wound stuff, you know, expose the injury site and use the some type of occlusive dressing to treat that. Shock. This was a great segue into the class that Doc taught last month. We had a, he taught an excellent class with the EMS rounds on the uh, shock and really got into depth in that. And shock is a really important thing, uh, medical thing that you're going to have to deal with when this person is injured, when you start to bleed like this. I'm going to show you a video here of an officer that is, is gets shot on an active scene. So the, the takeaways from this is you're going to see this police officer in a position of cover. You're going to hear two gunshots, and one of those bullets actually hits him in the neck. It's a barricaded suspect. Very common call these days with these barricaded suspects. And he's in behind a position of cover. He does direct pressure to himself, self-aid, runs from that position of cover, and ends up out in the open. There was actually a uh, reporter that was embedded with this, with this, that's filming this whole thing. That's how it all got caught on film. Is horrific. We warn you. Two officers responding to a call when the suspect fired several shots, hitting the officer behind that white pickup truck. The camera zooming in, and you can see him holding his neck, blood flowing down his arm. This officer quickly running across the road, falling to the ground. The second officer pulling him to safety. Matt Johnson with our local affiliate KSWB is there on the scene live in San Diego. Matt. Megan, what we just learned is that the officer has been identified as 28-year-old Jared Slocum. He is a four-year veteran of the police force. We were told moments before he was shot in the neck right here in this San Diego County neighborhood that the suspect in all of this shot and killed his four-month-old child. Now, police are still collecting evidence right now. They're trying to determine if the body that was found near the front entrance of the house that was burned down where the shooting took place is that of the suspect, Kevin Collier, but the body is so badly burned. Police say again that he shot his four-month-old toddler and possibly his mother-in-law, so they're still unclear whose body is in the home. Now, the officer that was shot was responding to a call of a man waving and shouting and also shooting a gun. You can see in the video, the officer Slocum grabs his neck after being shot. His partner and a few witnesses in this neighborhood drag him to safety. He's then taken to a nearby hospital. Now, police say during is horrific. We warn you. So with that video, you saw the officer going to shock. You said that loss of time, date and place. His weapon was he was flagging everybody with his weapon there. And he ran from a position of cover out into the open. It's just how the body reacts to uh, when it goes into shock like that. So it kind of hints at those points that we were talking about. And as that video continued on, they actually affected a down officer rescue by dragging that officer into a cruiser and driving him to the hospital. We're talking about thinking outside the box. That was a great affected rescue. You don't have to wait for the big red truck to show up. They got the officer to the hospital by using that cruiser. And that direct pressure is what stopped the bleeding. You saw how much blood came out of that, out of his neck there. And how does the body react to it, right? So we talk about how much blood is lost and what your body will begin to do. So everybody in this class, right, you have five liters of blood in your body. These are one liter bottles that I 
it's basically tomato juice that I was using to put this together. And the major, uh, there's like seven different types of shock, but the one that you're worried about is hemorrhagic. You know, it's a condition when the body can no longer provide nutrients and oxygen to all parts of your body and cells are going to be in the starve and die from that lack of oxygen and nutrients, um, you know, at the very basic level. Once you start punching holes in the body, we have to get whole blood back in there. And that can only be provided at the hospital. We don't have the capabilities yet of getting whole blood into the field. You know, the military is experimenting with direct transfusions and all this other crazy stuff. But you got to be careful with that. It, you can, if you put the wrong blood type in somebody, you can kill them. And it's a very painful way to go. But you need, so what your thought process is when you have a large amount of blood loss, getting them to that next higher level of care. You know, take on that ultra mental status and, you know, one or two liters may not kill you. The most obvious sign though, is that ultra mental status. You saw it right there in the video. Um, I mean, I can tell you all the stories I want about times in combat, but nothing prepares you for the real thing of, unless you're seeing it like in a video like that. You know, it's, it's very simple to identify. You don't need any special tools. And they're just going to be, the major one's going to be disorientation of time and place. And when you're dealing with the officers, aware of it, be aware of their hands and what they're doing. You know, environmental stuff, weak rafts and radial pulse. If they're that far into being into shock and they have that much blood loss, what's happening is the body's going into self-preservation methods. It's trying to suck blood from the, from the extremities and pull it to the core to maintain life. You know, if you're if you're losing that lost that amount of blood, that person is going to be uh, in in a serious amount of hurt if you don't get them to the hospital quickly, uh, not due to medications or head injuries. Again, like I was saying, you don't need any special tools to identify this. So we're going to talk about blood loss in you know half a liter uh, increments here. Mental state still going to be alert, lost a half a liter of blood. Uh, radio pulse is strong, heart rate's normal, breathing rate going to be normal. They can die from this now. Now you lost a liter of blood. Mental state still going to be alert. Radio pulse will be full. Heart rate's going to begin to increase because the heart is a pump at the end of the day. That's all it is. It's a pump. It's trying to move fluid around its container. And as you saw in the beginning, that video, once you took the pressure out of that pump by punching a giant hole in the artery, they lost all his, his motor function as well. It began to collapse. Breathing rates will be normal. Die from this now. Blood loss. You know, a liter and a half at this point. Mental state going to be alert, but anxious now because he's getting into that shocky, shocky mindset there. What the radio pulse may be weak now. Heart rate's 100 plus. Breathing rate's going to increase. The heart's trying to compensate for that loss, and the breathing rate's increasing, trying to increase the oxygen exchange. You're going to die from this? Probably not. Now you lost two liters of blood. Mental state's going to be confused, slow to respond. You know, radio pulse going to be weak. The heart rate's going to be increased. The respiratory rate's going to be pretty high. There's a good possibility you can die from this. No interventions taken. Now you've lost half the blood in your body. Mental state's going to be completely unconscious. Radio pulse is going to have none. Heart rate's going to be 140 plus. Breathing rate's going to be 35 plus. There's a good chance they're going to die from this. Unfortunately, there's not much going to be able to do. So what the thought is, take a two liter bottle of soda and dump it on the floor and look at how much spread out that fluid goes across the floor. You know, you can look at that as an identifying factor. But what if the victim moves, slid, or there's multiple victims? It just goes to show you how much blood can be lost and still be fixable. So what can you do in that environment to fix shock, right? Stop the bleeding like we've been talking about all night. You know, you can elevate the legs. That's still, that's still a thing. Um, you know, warm the casualty, especially to prevent hypothermia. The big worry with that is, is that it interferes with normal blood clot. But number one, stop the bleeding. Tourniquets, hemostatic agents, direct pressure. Whatever you need, plug the holes in the container, right? Get them out of that environment and get them to that next higher level of care. We got to re refill the container. We talk about this for, uh, we've been putting this out there because we did it in the military. We all had our blood types on our gear. It was like a cool guy thing to do. The thought was, you know, you show up at the hospital. And back then, it was definitely a possibility because that was your gear that you were wearing. In the real world, in what our environment, everybody's switching gear. You know, if you're assigned to the truck, there's, a set of armor assigned to that physical vehicle for the latter one. There's four different groups of guys that are going to be using them. Somebody might be on an overtime shift. You know, there's no point in putting a blood type on there. Um, o negative is the one that they can give to everyone. And most likely when you go to the hospital for blood transfusion, my understanding is they're obviously going to identify your blood type, which could take 20 minutes or more, uh, depending on the availability at the lab. 
point out, O negative can be used for, for anyone at that point. There's, all, there's a lot that goes into it, but just be aware of that. Hypothermia, you know, we talk about that because you can't generate heat normally with a massive amount of blood loss. It's even in a warm environment, you know, that hypothermia is definitely a possibility. You know, you want to keep these people warm because it interferes with that normal blood clot. It's very hard to rewarm somebody in the field setting. And there's some simple stuff you can do to prevent hypothermia. The space A blankets, these things are cheap. They're like, I don't know, five or 10 bucks. You can get them just about anywhere. It's basically tinfoil. It's a tinfoil blanket. We have these in the military, um, you know, for guys that, for mass casualty type incidents. And it works well. It's another simple piece of gear. It's another tool for your toolbox, you know, for, for your, um, wherever you might be operating. We just touch on further care for, you know, once your victims are stabilized. This is more for outside the building. When you're driving to the hospital, when you're outside the building in that mass casualty, in the, the secondary triage area, trying to get them to the next level of care, you know, but check for additional wounds. That's the big one. Don't get tunnel vision. You know, I made that failure point of getting stuck on the gunshot wound to the face. I completely forgot about the chest. You know, there might be something you might not see. Expose the wounds, though, and get the job done. You know, it's don't be afraid. We call it trauma naked, but we cut that clothing away and look for injuries you might not see, and especially armor after care if you're still in an active um, gunfighter role at that point. So tension pneumos, like we we're talking about. The movie Three Kings depicts this tension pneumo and the treatment of it perfectly. It's the only freaking movie I've ever seen that depicts a medical incident pretty well. I got to give it to them. They did a really good job, including up to the needle size. You know, it develops some sucking chest wounds, blood trauma, like we talked about. It can happen spontaneously. And it's very treatable and easy to fix. So the air builds up in this chest cavity here. You can see the collapsed lung. And the, the person suffocates to death is how, is how the death comes about. Hey, we made the right choice today, Conrad. You stop with that shrine shit. Everything's going to be okay. Say so? I know so. He's not a bad man. We're getting out of here. Hey, Manka! Would you please fuck it up? God damn it! A bad day at Vice T's day in the week. This year, sucking chest wound the chest. Should be treated by an inclusive dressing. They kind of fast forwarded this process essentially because it's a movie, but this is what will happen over time. Below the third rib. Air is released from the cavity. Lung reinflates. I feel better. But that's how the tree air pressure is going to build up about every 15 minutes. Release the valve and you close it back up. Chest tube as well help prevent that. But the even the needle was right. You need at least a three inch needle, two and a half to three inch needle, because what they're finding is with the IV catheters, you're not getting the depth that you need to get an actual get into the cavity of the um, the chest. The reason why it's a paramedic level skill is you can hit other arteries and stuff, and they have not inserted right. You can't just go stabbing all over the chest with these things. But um. At my level of care on the battlefield, 
I usually didn't have my patients long enough to do this type of care, but you'll hear that there'll be diminished lung sounds on that side. And it's just something to be aware of. You even had the breathing right with the, with the snoring respirations. We did it on a pig during the test lab. We took a big 50 cc syringe and we were pumping air into the pig's chest cavity until we created an intention pneumothorax. And then we actually stuck a needle in just like you saw there, instant air release just like that. And the pig started breathing normally again, like nothing even happened. It was pretty amazing. There was also a study, not a study, but an incident in Germany where there was a long extrication. When you talk about places like Barville, um, you know, places that are farther out from care, and you end up with these crazy car accidents with, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes, hours on scene, trying to affect a, a actual um, extract. And this is what happened in Germany. There was actual video of the guy trapped in the car. A tension pneumo developed because he had a penetrating trauma to his chest. And he died from that because nobody realized he had a tension pneumothorax. And that's what the autopsy revealed is that's what's actually killed him. He had a tension pneumo built up. Nobody treated it. He made it all the way to the hospital with it. Nobody ever figured it out. Cardiac arrest and done. Um, so just be aware of that. It's a, it's a sneaky injury. The battlefield, they're starting to put these, uh, do a needle thoracentesis on anyone that has a gunshot wound to the chest. They're just poking all of them, usually on the uh, air medevacs out. Open pneumos, sucking chest wound, you know, very treatable at your level, like we we're talking about, can happen a number of ways, gunshot wounds, stabbing, sharp objects, car accidents, a million different ways for these things to occur, you know, just doesn't have to be, you know, from a, from a gunfight, you know, we use an occlusive dressing, we have these awesome, these uh, halo seals are very cheap, you know, you know, again, not to buy anything crazy, and you'll see just what they use with tape, you know, um, and think outside the box when it comes to this. AD pads, once again, great piece of gear. You can use expired ones if you want. They're still very sticky. They might not be usable for a cardiac arrest, but they still work as a, for a sucking chest wound. You have two pads in there, one for the entry, one for the exit. And they're pretty much in common places. And they're also kept in the back of a lot of cruisers for police officers. Um, you can use a bunch of different things. We're going more with the covering of the whole wound because it used to be tent up and angled to let fluids drain. And also you could pull it up a little bit and burp it to a lot, try to release some of that air so the tension no more doesn't build. If that doesn't work though, then you need something like a needle thoracentesis or um, you know, some type of method to release that air out. Obviously always check for an exit wound. And it is nature's way of telling you to slow down because a lot of the guys that got chest injuries like that in a gunfight, we, um, <laughs> they actually run, slow down real quick. Do you have an air leak now? I just double check and make okay. sure I have everything. Did you already pull a chest tube, sir? No, I got that over here. Yeah, I got you know, I love that, right? The guy was treated and they're doing a medical video on it. So you can only imagine what they're doing when you're knocked up. But uh, no, this is a great video of a second chest wound. It goes back to show how much damage the body can take and be survivable. Can you pull this off? It was a treaty. I haven't tried yet. Right. And they use basic medical tape on much like saran wrap. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You want to take a look at it without sure. that? Sure, I got a movie going. Oh, sorry. Sticky. I'm sorry. That's trying to help mom. He's pulling the tape off. I got a movie going. But uh, very treatable at your level. You can see how effective that is for that gunshot wound. Here's some other types of open pneumos we talked about from chest injuries. This officer on the left here was knew the suspect and constantly had, we say, complacency kills. That was a big saying on the battlefield. You know, we go to these calls every day. Grandma fell out of bed again. We're up at the nursing home. I mean, the day-to-day -day stuff constantly, right? We get complacent. It happens across the board. We're human. It's human nature. And what happened here was the uh, suspect had a samurai sword. You also got a little too close to him, took a swipe out of him, and created that injury there. And once again, you know, it goes back to what is a survival injury. I mean, at that point, you break out a roll of saran wrap and try to wrap that up. So that, that is one big hole to fix. But again, survival injury. What's a good way to avoid these things? These tension pneumos, right? Wear your body on them, or like the Marine Corps, you know, shoot him. We, we were the the most underfunded branch of the military. So we were always coming up with new ways to, to make things work. You know, they said Semper Gumby, always flexible, trying to figure things out. But a uh, couple different types of plates here, right? A couple different types of armor. This is what level one, two A, soft body armor. That's good up for nine mil, but these guys are wearing three and four. 
that can stop up to 762. 308 round, it'll stop that. Any of the high velocity stuff. Once you get to level four, now you're talking about armor piercing. Uh, that can stop, but it can only take one round of that. Level three is good up to six rounds of 762. That's a, I'll show you a video in a second of being used. Um, it's ceramic plates. But this is soft armor from what you see with a normal patrol. So this is in the war in Ukraine. There's a ton of good footage coming out. This has been an in-your-face war. Another threat we potentially could face that they're using over in uh, Ukraine war right now is drones. They're using your standard um, manufactured DJI, DJI and these other Chinese drones, and they're just hooking explosive devices on them, little IEDs, and dropping them on top of the soldiers. You know, so is that a threat we're going to face in the future? I don't know. Um, it's definitely possibilities being very successful on the battlefield. And like anything, like medicine, it transfers to the civilian world. Sure. Oh, two hours. What is this? No, it was weird. What this? One. Two. See how small those entry wounds are. Oh, actually, entry wounds, but entry hole. Three wounds. Three wounds. Three. 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 One. Two. Three. Вотже, раз, два, вот третий. Я, слава богу. Сейчас посмотрим, мини вороновский броник. Ты нормально живой? Да нет, там шишка чуть-чуть. Смотри. Блядь, раз. 762. Looks like hollow points. They didn't have time to expand. Здесь ничего. Даже с близкого расстояния говорят, пацаны. Оставляли. Я не ожидал, блядь. Зачем тебе надо было тут вообще суетиться? Неожиданно, прикинь, блядь. He took three rounds into that plate armor there. Saved his life. He's actually walking and talking. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. He's feeling it. But the stuff works. Sure. How he didn't get hit anywhere else is beyond me. I mean, that's just... The luck of the draw. It took three rounds of the chest, but didn't get hit anywhere else. It's amazing. Um, and lived to tell about it. That again, that was a ceramic plate that he was using. St their ceramic plates are just lighter and it's in essence, and they're way more expensive. Uh so steel plates do the same thing. Mission priority we use on our fire trucks, we have steel plates because that ceramic plate would break getting bounced around all day long in the truck. So mission priority for whatever type of mission that you might be uh working with. So this is a quick touch on for first responders, any police officers in the class, um, you know, your police officers first. Your primary mission is to be a police officer and mitigate threats, right? You're not, you're not, not normally a EMS responder. So it's good to have some type of medical equipment to protect yourself. These, that's a SWAT T there, a, um, a, a sponge, a quick clot sponge, and there's the threat plate right there. It's a special threat plate. It just adds more to, the, to that soft armor. Um, it's in behind there, and it's in a uniform location. So if you have a downed officer that you're responding to, you know exactly where his tourniquet is and his hemostatic agent is on his body because you want to keep yours for yourself in case you need it. But uniform location, you know, having to dig through pockets, did I leave it in the patrol car? Did I leave it at the house? You know, um, volunteer, same thing. You want to have it in your car or some way it's easily acceptable, I don't know, accessible to, for you to use. You know, you can develop those protocols and responses. Uh, but that's just kind of something that speaks to that. Quick touch on CPR. I say don't do CPR, especially because you're trying to do the most amount of good for the most amount of people. If a person has a gunshot wound to the face or they have signs incompatible with life, you know, we're so predicated on coming up with that first victim when we come into a scene, we're like, oh, we're going to treat this one that we just came across. You know, this, you're just wasting time, essentially. And look at the profile you present if it's still an active scene. You know, the casualty is going to stay dead. The mission gets delayed, whether you're the, the first responder or you're the, the armed responder in that sense. You run the risk of getting shot by doing this. Uh, it may be appropriate in the tactical setting, though, for things like hypothermia, electrocution, near drownings, heart attacks. 
And I put heart attacks in there, especially because we look at 9-11 when that battalion chief died, dropped dead in that tower from a heart attack. And how many times across the country do you see those uh, active incidents where you go from zero to 100 miles an hour and guys drop dead of heart attacks? It happens all the time in the, in, the, in the paid world and the volunteer world. You know, so it's just other types of things that you need to be aware of. You just got to weigh out that cost benefit. Everything we talked about, it's a gray area. You know, there's no right or wrong to it. It's all about doing something versus nothing. So summary of these points, summary of all this, you're still in a hazardous environment. You know, we've been talking about all night about gunshots and fire and all kinds of crazy things that you're going to be faced with. When we respond to emergencies, that's what it is. We're usually responding to someone's emergency. When you're in these types of incidents with active shooters, especially, it, you're part of the emergency. We're always talking about drive safe. Don't become a victim getting to the fire or the, the accident scene. You know, you want to drive within your limits and make sure you're going to get into the scene. So you, this is a really important to where you got to keep your head on a swivel. You got limited medical resources. Your primary concern is getting hemorrhage controls under, you know, with the tourniquets and direct pressure, hemostatic agents, and doing something for those victims. The airway management is just going to be rolling them on their side, the breathing, and, you know, make sure the airways are clear, treating sucking chest wounds. Because we look at Uvalde, right? That just happened recently. And some of these other active issues, I keep referring back to that one because that's fresh in everybody's mind. But when you look at the after action, right? Now these officers, the whole department just got suspended. And I guarantee you, unfortunately, there's probably going to be suicides out of this after the years go by, because I've been a victim of it. You know, I've been in the basement drinking the, drinking the beers. You know, they say find, you find God in the bottle after a gunfight, and you start thinking about the things and decisions that you made in that incident and how you could have done things differently, the survivor guilt and the failures that you made. And that's what makes you beat on yourself. You end up sucking the... The, the old 45 and, uh, you know, taking our own life. And that's where a lot of these suicides come from, unfortunately. So when you're in these types of incidents, it's doing something versus nothing and pushing past that fight or flight because it's just a natural response to a high stress incident is to take flight, you know, stay in the fight. It's not, when I say stay in the fight, it's not just putting rounds down range, it's staying in the mental game because you could have the best equipment, you could have the best training, and the best armor, it still lose the fight because you're not with it up here. You know, we look at Russia, they have more equipment and people they know what to do with, and they're losing the fight because those Ukrainians are very in the fight and trying to fight for what they believe in. You know, it's always mindset. Mindset will win the day. If you look at any um, any type of throughout history and gun and gun fighting. But management of shock is going to be important, hypothermia prevention, communication, not only with the casualties and talking with them and affecting a rescue. It's going to be talking to the outside resources and talking to the team that you're working with. You know, we in aviation, we talk about when you're under stress and things are happening in the aircraft and things are going on and, and these active shooter incidents, when you're getting bombarded with information, not only visually, but auditory, people screaming at you, yelling at you, I need help, and there's smoke and there's fire and you can't see what you're doing and there's blood everywhere, things start to get tuned out. And the first thing to go is going to be the radio. You're going to not be able to, you're just, it's just going to kind of fade out of your thought process. The chief can be calling you directly by name and you're just not going to know, your body's going to shut that voice out and you're going to lose contact with what's going on on the outside, that resource you might need. So going back to that with the communication, your know, radios are going to be completely overwhelmed and destroyed by radio chatter from all different agencies responding. It's going to come down to a direct line of sight, like, hey, go out that door. We got safety over there. You know, this is, come to me, whatever it needs to be, but just do it direct face to face. And, you know, again, stop the bottlenecks, small unit leadership, small unit tactics, make the decisions on your level. And then no CPR. If the person's dead, he's going to stay dead. Move on past. You're trying to do the most amount of good for the most amount of people. So my final thoughts on this, you know, stay in the fight. Like I was just saying, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Focus on the task at hand. When you're applying these tourniquets, take the few extra seconds to make sure you have it on properly. You have it above the injury site, the bleeding's under control, and you're affecting a good solid rescue. Are right? you getting that person out of that, out of that situation? Are you getting them to the next higher level of care? Because in the moment, there is no time to think. You're just gonna have to make decisions. And the decisions you're gonna have to make, you're gonna have to live with. Don't get bottlenecked, don't get caught up because 
you're going to have some of the best trained people there and they're going to be looking around like, hey, what do we do? Or what do you think? Or what do you think? Like, don't get caught up in that moment. And I put this slide up here, you know, welcome to Noah. Welcome to, it could never happen here in USA. You know, who knew? I didn't know Uvalde on a map. I didn't know Columbine on a map. Newtown, all these locations where these active shooters have taken place has never, nobody's ever heard of them. Nobody's heard of Boroughville, Rhode Island or North Providence, Rhode Island. You know, we, we want to train and be prepared for these types of responses because it's going to come at some point in time, unfortunately. It's just the world we live in. You know, these guys are getting better at what they do. We need to continue our steps in providing good care for these casualties. You know, applying tourniquets properly, communication, uh, providing cover, and it's going to be a rapidly changing and dynamic environment. Uh, I can't, again, I can sit here and preach all day long about how chaotic it's going to be, but nothing's going to prepare for the real thing. And, you know, what, if you're an armed first responder and you're in these incidents, your primary goal is to go after that shooter. You know, you're going to have to pass down kids down victims, people are going to be pulling at you and screaming for your help. You have to focus on what your mission is. And then after that shooter's down, now you're going to start treating casualties. But I put this slide up here because this goes, these are the Marines that were lost in the war on terror that I was with. These, these were my Marines that were lost during the deployments that I was there. And some of their actual family members are in this class tonight. And I just want to say thank you to them because this is what freedom costs at the end of the day. You know, freedom isn't free. And unfortunately, it's paid in the blood of, uh, you know, um, other Americans. And it goes back to us as first responders. You know, we're first responders on the front line of defense to these types of incidents. And after the first responders, who is the next response? There is none. You know, the military going to show up. We're going to be here in a day or two. You know, we are the first and last line of defense. And we need to continue the training, keep the communication going and the thought process and how to respond to these types of incidents. You know, the world's a constantly changing place and we need to adapt to that world as well. And uh, I thank you all for coming to the class tonight and I appreciate uh, sitting through this, this long presentation here, but hopefully you guys get some uh, takeaway from this and I'll open the floor to questions. And uh, Doc, do uh, you have anything you want to put in here? Thank you for hosting this as well for, for us tonight. Yeah, no, Josh, thank you very much again for doing that. And I, um, I, you know, thank you for your service and certainly for your expertise in this, in this field. And I, and I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of great information here that we'll be able to use going forward. Thanks again. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We, uh, if anybody's looking for more training outside of this, we, we have a program that we can bring to you. We do workplace violence. We do active shooter. We do the whole um, we, we bring in the threats, we do the, we go through the schools, we can set you up with security and we can really do some advanced training for you as well. If, if you're looking for that type of stuff for your agency or, or department or whatever it might be, we're just trying to uh, save lives. And, you know, we've had a couple of saves out of this program where the officer lost his arm up in North Dakota. He responded to an incident and used the SWAT team, to save the guy's life. He was caught in a machine and they have long transport times up there, arterial bleed. Came, literally came out of the class and went to it. We got a phone call about it. And then uh, a police officer in New Hampshire that came to our class was shot in the neck and uh, used a quick clock to stop the bleed. So the stuff does work, you know, in the civilian world for, and obviously as well as the military. And all one touch for anybody with canines, this stuff does work on canines as well. That, that's always come up in that question. So you can use quick clock, hemostatic gauges, and tourniquets. You can use it in the canine world because that's been a new uh, protocol we've gotten in uh, Rhode Island State Protocols for treatment of canine officers, um, the dogs themselves. I'll be on here for a little bit. If anybody has any questions, you can drop them in the chat. And uh, thank you guys all for the, the wonderful comments there. Um, I'll, I think my contact info will be left somewhere. I keep looking all over. I got six screens up there, so I keep looking all over the place. <laughs> Thank you, Doc, again for hosting this. And Joshua, to uh, one vet to another. Uh, thank you for your service. Appreciate it. Hoorah. Hoorah. Semper Fi, brother. Thank you for yours as well. Yeah, Semper Fi.
I got to stop the recording yet, too. Hey, Josh, Josh. thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. Hoorah. Hoorah. Semper Fi. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Randy there. Another big uh, name of EMS. We worked, I worked with Randy here in the chat for uh, years before I actually went in the military back in the early days of Hopkins Hill. And we talk about, um, you know, I was, I was you at one point, all, all of you in this class here, you know, I didn't have any military experience, didn't have any combat experience and was thrown through wolves the same way a lot of you guys will be, unfortunately, with these types of incidents. And I, I hope you all be able to succeed. Oh, thanks, sis. I was in Iraq, too, with my sister there, Becky. She was uh, my supply convoy. <laughs> it's great to see some old names and faces in here. Outstanding. Thank you for the service. We'll catch up offline, too, Ona, before he deploys. Doc, when I stop the recording, how do I, does it automatically save? Yeah, yeah, it'll automatically, um, we'll get an email from uh, Team Health and it'll automatically come as, a, as an email that, it, and then we'll put the link out on the website as we usually do. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank that. you. Absolutely. Thanks. Josh, solid work, buddy. Thanks. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. This. Oops. There we Outstanding. Thank you, Randy. Thank you all. All right. If nobody has any questions, I guess I'll end the session here. I appreciate you guys all attending and uh, thank you again for all the support and stuff and, and uh, stay in the fight out there. Be safe, everyone. You know, the world we live in, like I was saying, it's, it's a different world now. Trying to figure out how one. All right. Thanks again, Josh. Thanks, Doc. Yep. So long.